My name is Abed Rahman. I am a board certified anesthesiologist and the pain physician. So I have dual certification, uh, an extremely large inner city hospital in Chicago, Stroger Hospital of Cook County, uh, which is the major regional trauma center in Chicago, and um, also do quite a bit of cancer pain in addition to anesthesiology. So a little bit of everything. I uh, have a very large anesthesiology residency program here of about 10 uh, residents per year, and we take four pain fellows per year. It, it took me years into practice to appreciate the best part of being an international graduate. Um, I think um, when, you, when I first came out, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed being the underdog. Um, and then you realize scores matter. Then you realize what you've done in your life is matter. And then you realize international graduates tend to have a reputation of being the scrappiest and hardest working individuals out there. So it's really nice. Uh, and we don't have anything handed to us. So you have to kind of uh, uh, work extremely hard for every opportunity and every uh, um, potential uh, opportunity that comes your way. Why did I pick anesthesiology? Was it my first choice? Uh, no, actually my initial residency was in neurology. I thought I'd be a fancy neurologist. And then when I realized it was a lot of a mental field neurology, but it wasn't much hand by hand. I like to do procedures. I like to do things. When I realized that, I kind of was disillusioned. I said, okay, what else can I do? So at two in the morning while seeing a seizure patient, as I'm writing all the orders in the computer, an anesthesiologist was sitting next to me. And he came in for an appendectomy. And he looked at me and said, you know, I'm going to work uh, late tonight, but at 7 a.m. I go home. And I looked at him and said, I want that job. Uh, but, you know, as an international gra uh, medical graduate, I had no experience in anesthesia. So it was as I started to learn in the field, I really enjoyed it. Um, anesthesiology, I must admit, is probably one of the fields where you need to know everything. Uh, it's kind of like a family physician, but in the operating room, you have to know everything. Um, and you must accept while being a physician, you are part of a team, you know? So, you know, most surgeons, most newer surgeons are really, um, you know, complimentary. They re we, everyone works well together, but you'll get the occasional one that sometimes I see the residents almost, you know, shell shocked if a, a surgeon yells and I tell them, look, they have a lot of stress on their mind. They're focused on this. We take care of everything else. And we have to be, we have to be preoperative physicians where we see the patient's preoperative, look at the whole patient. Intraoperative, almost as if critical care physicians, in addition to intubating, placing lines, doing procedures, um, and postoperative for pain issues. So I think being an anesthesiologist, I have grown to respect patients, especially laboring patients. So we have to take care of laboring women when they're going to deliver. So there's a lot of things we have to do. And if you're looking at this field for credit and to be noticed, maybe not the best thing, but over time, all the surgeons, all the other physicians truly become your colleagues. So I'm in a good field, but Sometimes they're texting me on the weekends, the surgeons asking me about patients. So, and I say, oh, why don't I give up my cell phone? But uh, realistically, I, I love the field. Now. I really do enjoy whether I'm doing anesthesiology or in the clinic seeing patients or in the operating room operating as a pain physician. So I, I do enjoy all of it. My first uh, year residency was a hybrid of medicine and neurology. Um, and uh, so that, that was my first year. Um, then when I started anesthesia, it was a little bit different because I went from wearing shirts and ties every day um, to wearing scrubs. And instead of coming in to start rounding at 8 a.m., I had to be in the hospital at 5 a.m. Uh, and sometimes I wouldn't leave until six or seven at night by the time the operating room cases are done, seeing the patients afterwards, seeing the patients for the next day. And then, you know, every so often at five, four or 5 p.m., a surgeon has an emergency, so then, it was a lot of realizations and it, it was accepting a new field. It was challenging in its own ways um, because it was quick thinking and immediate uh, judgment. Uh, it was also, we have to move very quickly. And as a, as, a, as a young resident first starting out, I wasn't quite there. 
Uh, I wasn't understanding uh, sometimes why we were doing things in a certain way, but as time went on, it made sense. And I, I, I think of all the specialties you see anesthesiology, all the physicians are, we really tend to be very collegial. Um, my group of resident mates, all 10 of us, we were together, um, were, I think we all still communicate and we're all throughout the United States. One of us is actually overseas now, but we all still communicate. So it's, and this was 20 years ago. So it, it, it's, you were there long nights, long weekends, holidays you, you're with the, you're with your uh, resident class more than your own family so that's a tough one uh, but people like me who sometimes blur the lines I invite my family over to the hospital since I'm on lockdown anyway so you know so be it <laughs> so my experience uh, was very good it was a lot of reading a lot of learning uh, as a PGY1 that was my experience um, everything you learn in medical school and for exams a little bit different. Now you have to apply it. Um, you know, th there's a saying in anesthesia, 99% boredom and 1% sheer terror. And it, it's true. Most of the time things are smooth. You're over-prepared. Um, you have to, what I learned is I cannot blame anyone else. So while most hospitals have anesthesia technicians to stock the rooms, I found myself most days walking in getting supplies as a PGY-1, stocking up the room, filling up the anesthesia vaporizers, making sure my drugs are drawn up, labeling them. So it's those little things, the attention to detail is the most integral part of anesthesia. Um, there is no such thing as pointing the finger, which is what I learned and I expect at a PGY-1 residence. Uh, when you don't know, ask for help. So even now as an attending, if a PGY-1 calls me the night before to discuss a case, if you are excited and, and interested about a case and you think you could place an arterial line or a central line or epidural before surgery, if you are motivated and prepared, I'm all in. It, that, because what happens is you make me excited to come to work to do this case. Um, and, and I think that's the expectations, the, the excitement, the motivation. Um, for medical students, um, I'll... I'll, I'll bring up a little bit later the things we look for in medical students because I, I've interviewed over maybe 3,000 candidates for the anesthesia residency. So we'll discuss that. So stay tuned for that. When interviewing medical students and uh, looking for those applicants, I, you know, being in the field for a little while now, you start looking at it where you don't care color, race, creed, sex. It doesn't matter what we look for. And I look for is who's hungriest, who has done things during medical school. Medical school is extremely stressful on its own. Being an international graduate, it's even more stressful. However, if you are, if you are, if you are compassion, if your passion is to go into anesthesia, and you know why, there are things to do as a first, second year, third year medical student. Um, there are opportunities just to join the American Society of Anesthesia medical student component. Um, and I highly recommend that. Those are some uh, organizations U.S. medical students join. And and the thing about international is if you know, if, if information is shared, international graduates are extremely competitive. Obviously, board scores are one. What else have you done? So things like contacting the American Society of Anesthesia, uh, there's a website or an email you can send to them uh, or a website, www.asahq.org forward slash medical students. And I even actually have it here from, from an article I actually keep for anyone interested, but this is the American Society of Anesthesia, things you can look for. Now, that's one aspect. Another one is, what have you done? Um, not just in medical school, it's tough to do much, but here's like presenting posters at conferences. I know it may be an additional expense, um, you know, but doing poster presentations, if you rotate with an anesthesia department, say, hey, do you have a case I can present at the anesthesia conference coming up? And you present it, because if I see a poster has presented by a medical student, my eyes light up. If there's research, and it's tough to get in research if you're there for a couple months, but if there's anything you can help, that's one way to try. But it's really hard because research sometimes takes a year to two years and then another year for publication. So um, 
those are the kind of uh, things that we look for really well is what have you done? I also, I'll be honest, my first question I ask at any medical student interviewing is, what was your first job you've ever had? And I only, I only get concerned is if someone tells me I've never had a job, all I've done is study. Medicine is not about just being a physician. It's what else do you do? Do you, have you tutored? Do you do Taekwondo? Do you play sports? Do you play an instrument? Um, it doesn't have to be volunteering in a hospital. What else do you do? Are you into theater? Are you into, um, you know, many things? So there, you know, those are really important things that I think um, a well-rounded physician should be because otherwise I'll tell you in medicine, whether it's anesthesiology or another field, you will burn out. So this is something to carry you during residency and during, as an attending, work is not your life. You're a physician at work, but outside you're a person. So those are some of the things. Um, other things to look for in applicants for residency are failures. Um, myself, if someone can honestly, when I ask you, what have you failed at in life? A response is, of nothing is not a good response. You, everyone fails. You know, we may have failed in a, in a classwork, at a job, in a, uh, an attempt to, for, to organize an event, something. If you failed, but you've learned and you've picked yourself up, that's okay. If you've quit something, that's okay if you've learned from it. So no one is perfect. And sometimes the students that try to show how perfect they are, you kind of realize, okay, there's issues going on here. So we're all humans. And as long as you can show layers of failure and you've gotten back up, you know, now, of course, we don't want F's in every single medical school class, you know, but if there's a class you scored a C in or a D that you had to redo, it's okay. Well, you know, have you learned? What did you learn? So those are things we do look for. So a uh, great question of what do I like being most, most about an anesthesiologist? Being an anesthesiologist is the intense, re intense relationship you have with a patient. I mean, there's nothing more frightening than going into surgery. Uh, you know, on Monday, I had to take a child into the operating room. And parents are there almost in tears because that's their most prized possession. So I know I have to come for that child. Um, so I, I have to be very creative. And it's not always with medication. There's other things we can do. If I have an adolescent, I'll say, I'll have them bring in their video game as we're going off to sleep. So with a young child, I'll have them reading in the balloon of, of nitrous oxide laughing gas as, as we both sing the SpongeBob theme song. Yes, I know that. So there's a lot of things I have to know um, as a physician, but also the complex medical history of a lot of our patients. Postoperatively, if there's pain, what can I do? I prefer to do a lot of regional, which is nerve blocks, which is injections for, for after surgery, so they're not on narcotics, things of that nature. I love anesthesiology because you get to branch off and be a critical care physician to the int intensive care unit. Uh, and I think, you know, as we start getting older, we start seeing that it's not a bad option. Uh, some of us like being in clinics, seeing patients too. Um, chronic pain patients, a majority of them are just all, any person that has injury and they want to get back to work, they want to get back to life, but they might need an injection or they might need something to help them out. The cancer patients are a different story. I, this is one of my most favorite areas in anesthesiology is doing cancer pain. So I can do, you know, these are end of life patients who are truly struggling and they're miserable and to give them relief with an injection where I will literally destroy a nerve to block the pain for several months. I'll implant pumps in their spine. Uh, I'll implant uh, wires around their spinal cord. These are surgical procedures, but this is why I like anesthesiology. You get to do other fields. You get to branch out and do many other specialties. So, you know, 20 years in, I still do house calls to some of our patients. I can no longer come out to the hospital or the clinic because of their medical conditions. So um, it is, I think it's a fun field. One of the first things when I walk in the operating room, if I have a resident, first question I say to them on the first day is, what fellowship are you doing? You have to do a fellowship. I know it's an additional one or two years, but it makes a difference for your future. And this way, I can do a, a child. I can go to open heart anesthesia. I can go to the critical care unit to do critical care medicine. I can go to clinic. And then for fun, I can go to the operating room and this time operate as a surgeon. So there's a lot of things you can do as an anesthesiologist that most people are not aware of. 
Um, and then as you're in it, you start to understand it and appreciate it. So that, that's my fun time and be a child. Great question into what are some of the top challenges uh, in the field of anesthesiology, um, being a physician. And, and there are a few. Um, some of them are, you know, many times you, you wish as a physician anesthesiologist, you can just go to the operating room and handle one patient only and, that, and just for the whole day and focus on the one patient. But as a physician, there's added stresses. Uh, many times you'll be working with nurse anesthetists who are very good at their job and they'll handle one patient, but you may cover three operating rooms. So you have to be very mobile. Um, so those are some of the challenges, but you start to develop an appreciation for it after a while. Um, some of the other challenges are dropping reimbursements. And I think that's going across the field of medicine. Um, and I think because healthcare insurance companies realize they can pay less and many times we're just going to take it. We're not in business for a reason. Um, but the, the ways to do that is there are grassroots movements. I know the American Society of Anesthesia itself has been very vocal and actually worked really hard on um, on increasing reimbursement. So I think, you know, we've, we've worked very hard that way. And also, if you're going in a field that you truly enjoy, if the reimbursement drops off a little bit, it, it doesn't bother you as much. Uh, you still make a very comfortable living. Um, so, you know, we have to accept that. Um, malpractice. Now, we pay a very fair malpractice rate. Uh, I, I think we're envied by many other specialties. We tend to have the riskiest field, I'd say, but our malpractice, because our American side of anesthesia has shown that in general, we have an extremely safe profession. And again, 99% of the time, our specialty is very smooth with minimal issues that has helped us really drop our malpractice rate. So, um, you know, if I say an annual malpractice policy of 30,000, Sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but when you realize a surgeon can pay 100000 you realize we're okay, uh, we're okay. So if our, if our reimbursement drops off, it's okay. Uh, so those are some of the challenges. Some of the other ones are <clears throat> being a physician, you work holidays, you work nights. You know, I, I work every single Friday night, so I'll usually work till 7 a.m. Saturday. So that's a sacrifice from my family. And I've come along with that by adjusting my personal life. So when I leave work, I really try very hard to cut it off, which is why we want to be a well-rounded physician. So, um, so those are some of the challenges, but there's ways to navigate through and, and accept it and work with it. So a good question of uh, residency program director, if I was that, I am on the pro, uh, residency selection committee. Uh, so question is, what do we look for? And the scores, most programs have a set score just to get an interview. So many times, if you're offered an interview, that means you've met the requirements. And, and it's always changing. Um, as the USMLE scores trend upwards, they do tend to change year to year or every couple of years. But the things we do look for are, have there been poster presentations, um, extracurricular activities such as hobbies, sports, uh, other things you've done, non-medical activities, um, you know, and, and many times letters of recommendation. There's a lot of letters that can be generic, but there are some when you read them really say, okay, this physician really did like the student. This student was, and, and, and so as we read through them, there are things we tease out of that. Um, you know, we do look at, um, if someone's had a fault, um, you know, we've had, we've had excellent residents that probably would have not been given an, a position in, uh, in other programs. One who had a DUI in 20 some years before they were applying while they were in college. So, you know, we understand people make mistakes. So we do look at the whole application. So, um, poster presentations. Um, if there's research or things you're involved in, also during the interview process, if you list a poster or you list a research, I'm going to ask you questions about that. So if your name happens to be on, you really need to know your work. Um, 
you know, so we look at, we do look at scores. We do look at attempts. Sometimes we'll even look at uh, not just medical school, but undergraduate um, transcripts. We can look at sometimes even uh, MCAT scores if it's a tough decision, but we do look at the whole body of work. Um, so a little bit of everything going through the, through the, uh, with, with the applicants and how well you dialogue during the interview. Um, one thing I do recommend to any applicant coming in is know where you're interviewing. So if you're at our hospital, Stroger in Cook County, you have to know this is an inner city serving many individuals without insurances, many individuals who don't even speak English. So, you know, you're serving a lot of international individuals. So it always fitting that a lot of us international grads are here. Um, so uh, those are the things we do look for. So really know your programs, know the area, know what it stands for, um, and your, your, your body of work. This is a long process of a body of work. And I think the more you get involved, the more motivated you are. It does work in your, uh, to your benefit. The question is, how has COVID impacted our institution? Um, it has. Uh, it's different, and I think we're all adjusting to it. Um, a lot of the applicants now are doing uh, video calls, Zooms, or other uh, ways we have set up. I think we are set up through Zoom um, for all of ours. And, you know, we, we actually like it, and the candidates like it, too, because they save a lot of money on airfare. Um, and so do we. We actually like it too because, it, you know, we still get to interview, and you'll have three or four of us on a on a on a call with the applicant. So we do look. We do. We still look at body language. We look. Uh, is the applicant looking at us when they're speaking? Are they glancing at their cell phone? You know. So there are things we do look at. Um, and and the same things you look at for candidates, you look at through this as well. So um, it's just a little bit different, but surprisingly, we still get a good feel for someone dialoguing through the Zoom. So I would come ready and dressed up. This is an interview. Uh, have your first, you know, your best foot forward, uh, so to speak. So, so the question is, which medical school did I pick and why? So I was, while an undergrad, I wasn't sure where to go. And I did not know much of anything about uh, international schools. So there was one called Seba University that my good friend, Dr. Musa, was, we were in college together and he, he kept talking to me about. So we decided to take a leap of faith and we both went over there. So, um, it, you know, it was tough. It's a small school. You may not, may, we didn't have much of the resources I think a lot of traditional schools had, but now they have a full university in the campus. But you know, the goal was I was there to become a physician. That meant a lot of lonely nights, which ended up being perfect. When you're a medical student, you need to study. And, um, you know, there's the cost being away from family, but they did their best to provide an education. So, so just like with any school, you'll have some good teachers, some so-so teachers. Um, but overall, it was fine. The, the, the materials were there, a lot of late night studying rotations, they did their best to place you. So I rotated in Chicago, North Carolina, Connecticut. I went through multiple different states uh, to try to get uh, rotations and it did work itself out. Um, some rotations were great, some were not great, but, but the school set us up for the best chance to succeed. So I had a very good experience. Um, you know, everyone was there for the same reason, to become a physician. And I think, um, I'll, I'll be honest, I was very scared. I was extremely terrified, uh, you know, uh, being in medical school because it, you're, you're completely on your own and all day you're just trying to study and move forward. But um, back then the internet really wasn't a big deal. So we didn't have many uh, great resources like this to, to reference and, and to navigate through our, our medical path. So it was a lot of trial and error, it's a lot of asking, but I, I had a good experience. I you know, would I change anything about it? Probably not, because I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. So the most important piece of a document in the residency application, many times is, is your personal statement. Um, there's a lot of generic ones out there, but when you read them and there's true heartfelt letters, you can see most individuals' intentions. Um, I remember when I was writing mine, 
I knew what I wanted to say, but I struggled. I had a very hard time putting it on paper. So at the time I had um, someone help me organize it and then I was able to write it to make an impactful statement. Um, so those kind of things. And being an international graduate, you wanna start your application with something to catch the attention. So mine was, you know, my first line, I still remember 20, over 20 some years later is, it's fair to say I'm not your typical candidate. And that's, those are the things you want to emphasize. Uh, you know, you didn't have the path paved for you. You paved it yourself. And you had to go through obstacles. You had to fall. You had to travel to different distances because you had this passion. You had this drive. So those are some of the things you look for. And that person, that's what I look for. And I think a lot of my colleagues, personal statements and secondary letters recommendation. One really good question is, who, what candidate will I rank highest on the rank list? And I think, you know, it's a fun time to be in medicine uh, despite everything going on. And I look, at, um, I look at the candidates based on who they are. So it doesn't matter where someone's from or, you know, background or that. I, I look for the best person for the position. So it really comes through scores, obviously, letters of recommendation, personal statement, uh, those are the candidates, those that have went above and beyond. So you've presented a poster and there's nothing more intimidating than being a medical student and presenting a poster at the American Society of Anesthesia National Meeting with all of these seasoned anesthesiologists there listening to you. Um, it may be a case, it may be a case you were not even involved with, but you learned about it, you prepared it, and you presented it. And that really does show a lot of drive and that you're willing to take the extra step. Um, and a lot of uh, effort. So those are the things I do look for. Okay, perfect. Uh, the residency application process overall, how would you talk about that? Okay, the overall residency process, how would I talk about that? It is long, it's laborious, it's tedious, but everyone has to go through it. Um, we all have to sign up take these exams. We have to go through these websites. We have to, we have to follow the path that's been uh, set for us. So it, it, while it's a long process, you really only go through it once. Maybe you're doing it for the second time, but you go through it once. You try your best. You follow all the steps and you take every advantage of any resource around you that can help you out. Um, it is very overwhelming having all of these things on top of you and then so whether you're a foreign graduate, uh, international who struggles speaking English, or you were born in the US and you went to an international school, you still have to certify that you speak English. So while it might seem silly to some of us, some individuals uh, struggle. So, um, you know, I, one of our residents who just graduated, he struggled speaking English. His Chinese was amazing, but he did not speak English well. But during the... Uh, one second. Okay, thank you. Life of physician, always getting into my So sorry about that. <laughs> so concluding the, the uh, residency application overall is uh, improving ourselves. So one of our re graduating residents um, who spoke Chinese, he really struggled speaking English. And even during his intern year, he would take at a local community college, English speaking courses for non speaking, English speaking individuals. So tell that's like the most amazing thing to see someone willing to put in the extra work. So by the end of his residency, he speaks so well. And in the field of medicine, our communication is key. So when you see applicants willing to do the extra step, and I remember when he was interviewing with us, he said he would do that. And I was, we were always impressed he actually did it. Uh, right as he was starting. So um, th there are many things we look for. Uh, so final words of wisdom for our, our uh, international graduates uh, applying. You know, you're going to stumble. You may end up in a residence you don't even expect to be in. Um, ultimately, you end up where you're supposed to be. I always feel that. Um, enjoy what you're doing. It, it, you know, if you're in a field for the wrong reasons, you're really not gonna enjoy it. 
you should always go into a field you enjoy because medicine is long. Insurance companies make it feel longer. Um, so you really have to enjoy uh, everything. So keep working hard, never give up, follow as many steps, use as, as much help as you need. We, you cannot do this by yourself, so take any help you can get. Uh, but I myself always look for the most well-rounded applicants. So never quit being a person outside of medicine is, my, my, is one big thing to remind you of. So thank you and best of luck. Thank you.